This is the last coffee house. It's always a great day when we get to talk about a Thomas Old book. This is the quest for cosmic justice. There's been a lot of talk about justice lately, especially social justice, and within the last four years. But back in 2002, Sol was framing this question in a way we should have heeded, just like everything the guy said throughout his illustrious, though shrouded, career. <laughs> but this particular book is a collection of essays that were synthesized into the book. So, as always, we'll go through the content, we'll do an analysis, and then we'll do some big picture talk. So it opens to talk about how nature can neither be just nor unjust. The idea of cosmic justice is squaring all of the inequalities that the universe made for us, <laughs> which is kind of a weird, collective, arrogant insanity. So people, especially today, this is something that comes up. They seek not just justice, but cosmic justice. People are limited by birth. We are not born the same. And the social justice seekers believe that that's something that needs to be rectified. And the arm of power that they see to be able to rectify this is the government. A society that puts equality ahead of freedom will end up with no equality or freedom. Something that Friedman said, Milton Friedman. The real story is much more complex. And now usually when you think about justice, you think about all of the rules being applied to everybody in the same way. But the weird inversion that we're dealing with now and that Sol was talking about then is to kind of tamp down particular <laughs> groups, usually based on groups, and making sure that the rules apply unequally to achieve some kind of an outcome. So we go into this discussion about equality, and there's a reference to Rawls, who made a distinction between formal equality and fair equality. Now, formal equality is mostly tantamount to something like legal equality, and then fair equality is tantamount to equality of outcome. But the idea is, and the moving levers here, are that if you want equality of outcome, if you want the fair equality, then you need a third party, and the third party is going to need power to be able to make that change. And there's going to be a relationship between the degree of difference between people and the amount of power that a third party is going to need, like a government, to be able to flatten out all those differences across all the different parameters. But this requires much more knowledge. It requires superhuman knowledge to be able to understand all the differences between people. Because people are different enormously between each other, based on a ridiculous number of characteristics. And not only that, but people change over time. So it's not as though you're born and at you know, zero plus one or whatever, you're exactly the person with the same capabilities that you're going to be at the time of your death. So just imagine like a college admin person who's trying to evaluate a potential student who has submitted an, an application. Now, usually a college would have particular standards and all the standards are applied in the same way. So you have grades, you have extracurriculars. And then you look at their demeanor and how they deal with questioning and all that sort of thing. Now just imagine that that particular admin person has to go in blind to something like that with no standards and just make a determination based on an individually tailored idea about who this person is and whether they should be admitted to the school. You would have to have so much more information about this person to try to figure that out. It takes much less time and resources to just apply the same rules to everybody. There's a discussion of, to point out how complex it really is, is how black parents, single parenthood rate, and we've talked about this before, in the 1960s, it was about 80% two parents in black households. And then over time, once we got to today, it flipped entirely. And that's going to have a big impact on people's future prospects. And then he brings up this idea here that's something that he attacked in Black Rednecks and White Liberals, which is another book we read. We are so well read. It's unbelievable. Talking about how slavery, slavery is not causal. This is something that's been put forth that, that slavery is the thing that caused the disparities now. And he talks about how in England there are still disparities even though they didn't have mainland slavery in England. But these social justice types are very suspicious of even the idea of merit. And they proffer this cosmic justice ideal. And it could be the ideal, the cosmic justice, where you have the same everything, where everybody starts at the same place with the same resources, the same parents who have the same temperament to them as they have to everybody else, the same attractiveness, the same intelligence, the same emotional maturity, the same rate of development. You could have a world where everybody started out the same. But the question isn't, what should we do if we're God and able to implement all these things from the get-go? The question is, what do we do as humans, as higher primates, trying to figure out how to get from day to day, how to continue to tomorrow? 
And this is where we get an important distinction that I haven't used before, but I think is really fundamental to talking about this in the right way. The incentive effects of rewarding productivity. Now, I used to just say merit, just in general, who has merit and who doesn't. But it's not really about merit. Somebody can be lazy and meritorious. Obviously, that begs the question of what merit might mean in a broader sense, but we're just using it here to really have this distinction nailed down. We're saying that you have to reward productivity, and that's what you're paying for is productivity. Two people can be equally meritorious in something, but may receive completely different compensation for it. So it's the idea of productivity. That's what we're paying for. But disparity does not equal discrimination automatically. That's something that has just been bandied about all over the place, especially nowadays. In home loans, that was something that has been brought up even today, I hear it, but he talks about it at the time. In home loans, there was this disparity in black versus white loans being given to uh, prospective home buyers. So it was said, okay, well, this must be racism. It must be the people who are showing up are being subjected to racism by the people who are issuing these home loans. Of course, they don't bring up the differential between Asian and white, which was similar, but it's just Asians did much better than whites when it came to getting home loans. That's always left aside in all these disparity discussions, and it shouldn't be. But it turns out that this bank that was uh, disparately treating black and white applicants was actually a black-owned bank. So it was difficult to say that it must be some kind of a discriminatory bias that was leading to it. Of course, in reality, they were looking at the numbers, and based on those numbers and the desire to want to have a healthy business and make money, they were making those determinations based on that that reasoning. There are, of course, disparities between groups. No matter how you cut up any groups that you want to cut up, whether it's based arbitrarily or anything else, you're going to have disparities between those groups. And you're actually talking about people who are individuals at different stages of their lives. So at different stages of their lives, it's not just like uh, any given white person is going to be the same from zero to 100. There are going to be fluctuations and they're going to be much different at 60 when they've been working their whole lives than they were at 19 when they're just starting that. So there there are these cultural issues, too, that come into it, like this idea in some Indian communities that they're outraged at the thought that they're not entitled to something because they're less qualified, or this there's a, a concept in Nigeria about the tyranny of skills. Of course, now Nigerians uh, outperform a lot of Americans when they come here, but <laughs> that's another question. And this hostility that was talked about, I think, in his other book, too, of young black men and women to academics in general, this cultural hostility. Something like when we talk about acting white is was used as a pejorative whenever they'd use the proper grammar or something like that, which is, of course, ridiculous. It's something that Candace Owens talked about in Blackout, was that was something that she, she was subjected to. Uh, she was really into academics. She loved reading. She had very good grammar, was well-spoken, all that stuff, and she'd be excoriated as acting white, which is unbelievably patronizing and actually discriminatory to think in the in that way. And all these things, they have this negative impact long term. So something like if you don't have a representative workforce, uh, that can be deleterious to your business. If you move into somewhere and you're trying to hire and you end up hiring disparately, then you can be subjected to fines or lawsuits or whatever. So a lot of companies, what they'll end up doing is just going to homogenous neighborhoods so they don't have to worry about that. You know, they'll just go to all white neighborhoods and then they don't have to worry about that exposure to their companies. So they can avoid that cost. So it has this negative effect when you constantly talk about it in these terms. And Sol here says that affirmative action policies are less beneficial than equal opportunity policies. It should not be direct aid. It should improve the conditions so that people who are capable are able to take advantage of those conditions. And then that generally will raise all boats. This is something actually the Trump administration did with opportunity zones in a lot of these areas. But economic development is the best policy. It's not handouts. And he offers a warning at the end of this part of it where he talks about how actual cosmic justice might seem better, but then offers this parable about a dog with a bone who sees his reflection in a lake. And so seeing himself in the water, the bone in the water looks bigger than the one that he has. So he opens his mouth to go for it and loses the bone that's in his mouth. Okay, the mirage of equality. The abstract desirability of equality is different from what will, what will actually result from pursuit of this kind of equality. It's a mirage. Vast disparities have always existed, whether based on race or not, or any other arbitrary characteristic. But inferring from statistics, you know, basic statistics, is the reigning non sequitur of our time, <laughs> says Thomas Hull. 
even in the absence, even if you could completely squash, this is an important idea, even if you could completely squash all discrimination everywhere, the world would not be even. So that's why you have to be very careful about where you're claiming to say that there's evidence of it here or there or whatever. Even if you squash all of the discrimination everywhere, there's a wand and you can just get rid of it 100%, there would still be disparities. So then you'd have to explain that. And some of the bases, I mean, he goes through this list, you know, the incidence of minerals in the ground that you can find that are valuable, agricultural differences, irrigation ability, river access, seasonal changes, access to types of domesticable animals, and so many other things. Uh, the firstborn tends to do better and have a higher IQ than later born in families. And that's kids with similar genetics under the same household, and they still end up with disparities. So now we're talking about on the a population scale, hundreds of millions of people trying to square those disparities, even though under a single household with just a couple of people, where you have control almost entirely over the situation, you still can't get those squared. There's this attack of the idea of cultural appropriation here, which says that it's actually much worse for everybody. Because there's no need to reinvent the wheel. Good ideas that come from one culture and they cross-pollinate across cultures. You have these people who are pushing these identity narratives and promote these that would have everyone paint themselves into a corner rather than have that cross-pollination of cultural ideas. The high cost of envy. This is a big idea. So it used to be envy was a sin and now it's just social justice. And I think it was Thomas Sowell that said, I'll never understand how it's greedy to want to keep you the money that you earned, but not greedy to want to take money that you didn't. <laughs> so there were discriminatory policies against the Chinese, I think it was in Malaysia, that led them to leave. They were overproducing in the area, but they, they were subjected to these discriminatory policies, so they left. There were kids in like fourth grade who were doing high school level math, and instead of advancing them so they could see how good they could do, you keep them down for the benefit of the feelings, I guess, of the rest of the students. Price controls, of course, we've talked about those. I think in basic economics, we talked about those. Lead to the decline of quality and quantity of goods. So you have to ask, what is the cost of promoting this goal? If your goal is to exert your envy on the rest of the world, what is the cost of promoting that goal? And then there's this idea of freedom versus equality. These things are in contention. And you have to be wary of these visions that are these motivating things for powerful people. Like Lenin, Hitler, Mao, they all tried to change people to meet their visions. Lenin tried to support his imperialism using his statistics, and he just used them dishonestly. It's one of the easiest things to do, and one of the things that a lot of them did was to convince people of something obviously false with artfully used data. Like that the, wealth, the wealthy are wealthy because they stole something from the poor. Whereas in this system, in this kind of a system, like a capitalist system, it's not a zero-sum game. So society as a whole can be better off because the resources get to the people better able to use those resources. So the silicon and glass and plastic end up with the right people instead of the people who don't know what to do with it. Then there's this discussion of disarmament and how a general dogmatic application of disarmament and pacifism is a bad thing. And some talk about judges and how judges, I think it was Learned Hand and one of the other, was it Warren? No. Some judges were talking about how judges apply the law, they don't do justice. Because one another judge talked about how go do justice or something like that. And <laughs> this judge stopped the card. We don't perform justice. We apply the law. That's it. That's so refreshing, just like Amy Coney Barrett specifically talking about that. It's not about your personal ideas of what justice is or prejudice is or anything like that. It's specifically about being able to set all of that aside and applying the law period. And then there's a warning at the end here about how freedom isn't lost all at once, that it's eroded away amid glittering promises and expressions of noble ideas. And that is certainly the stage that we're in right now. Okay, some analysis. As always, uh, Thomas Sowell is offering a framework for finding out what's true. And it's more important the method by which he comes to conclusions and challenges how you're thinking about things than the actual conclusions that he comes to. This one, this particular book, was more philosophical and less empirical than is the other two that we read. Black Rednecks and White Liberals had tons of data all throughout. Basic Economics had a bunch of data through it. But this one was more philosophical. It's far shorter, too. <laughs> But this three for three, definitely ideas that blew my mind in all the books that he's written. Most important intellectual of the 21st century. I know he started in the 20th century, but the most important one that everybody needs to be reading and make sure they understand to make sure you have a framework for being able to figure out things in the future.
the ideas of productivity versus merit, making sure you're being clear on that, that it's about productivity, and that's what we're paying for here as a society, as a capitalist society. That's what we're paying for is productivity. The idea that if you solved all discrimination, you would still have disparities all over the place. It's really important. And how children in the same household still have disparities. So how are you supposed to manage the entirety of human civilization when you can't manage a household? Okay, big picture wise, uh, we need to get over this disparity fever dream that we're in right now. It's not just a mirage and empirically false. It encourages poor intellectual habits. The burdens on anybody making this claim to prove it with all the proper controls that nullify every other possible cause that the discrimination was the sole reason and that burden isn't placed on them enough nowadays because you're afraid they're going to call you names. So we can't let people get away with this. Just like uh, to give an example if something like came up about the income disparity gap. You say there, there are two groups, black and white, there's an income disparity, so therefore it must be racist or something like that. So you have to look at all the variables, things like uh, the gap in two-parent households. If those two things were equal, because that's such a huge predictor of societal health going forward, if those two things were equal and there was still a massive disparity, that could be a significant problem. You'd have to look at the rest of the variables. Uh, you have to look at the average age of people. Because of extremely high murder rates in places like Detroit and Chicago, the average age is lower. And because it's lower, you have less time to develop skills and have secure jobs and long-term income and interest on that income and all that sort of thing. So you have to look at that. Look at that. And you have to figure out where's the space for personal choice in all this, personal choice that is either good or bad, that you have to pay for. And it's unbelievably patronizing to say that one group gets to have personal choice and the other group does not. And anytime these come up, I always, <laughs> always talk about, okay, you bring up the bla black versus white, but what's the Asian versus white? Why isn't it a bigger deal that there is a, a gap on every one of these societal metrics between Asian and white and Asian do better, period, on all those metrics? Why isn't that a bigger deal? Why doesn't that come up more often? Why aren't we trying to rectify that disparity because of the, the privilege that Asians get to feel at the detriment of everybody else? So anyway, this is The Last Coffee. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening. I just love reading these books. I love reading these books. I love talking about these books. I wish we could have a little more back and forth, and I'll try to figure out a better way to be able to do that. But it's great talking to you. I hope all is well. Hope you have a good week, and I'll talk to you on the next one. All right, bye.